to know mm. times I've celebrated sweet drink I've tasted they come and go but there was a treasure poured without measure over the earth a light so so bright it outshines the brightest lights of are so glad we're so glad that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life we celebrate today because Jesus died and on the third day he got up amen but he gave his life he paid the ultimate price because he loved you so much so much. He is the King of glory. 
Do I have any worshipers with me today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we worship you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Hallelujah. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? Kingdom, glory, fill this place. We just want to be with you. We just want to be with you. Yes, the world.
just want I just want you I just want you I just want you I just want you nobody else will do Lord we just want you I just want you I just want you I just want I just want you 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 just nobody else will do nobody else come on everybody sing that with the say I just want you 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 nobody else will do just to, to focus why we're here tonight. We're here to worship our Lord and Savior. And for each of us, it has a deep meaning. And sometimes you just have to stop and think about how good Jesus really is and, and really what Good Friday means. paid the ultimate price so that we could live so that we could experience abundant life here but so that we could live throughout eternity with him and he was the only one that could pay this price no one else was worthy to pay this price he shed his blood for me and for you so I would like for us to sing this one more time, King of Glory, and, and, and sing this chorus and make it personal. I'm so grateful tonight because he's my king. I'm so grateful tonight because he's my Lord. Is he yours? Is it personal for you? So I want to hear the voices. Come on, here we go. King of Come on, y'all. and put those hands together and give them praise. Just to be close to you. Anybody in love with him? Just to be close with you. Just to be close to you is my desire. Just to be to you, just to be close to you, just to be close to you. 
just to be close to you is my desire. Come on, everybody, sing that to him. Just to be close to you. Yes, Lord, just to be close to you. We're desperate just to be close to you. It's my Before Jesus, we had no hope. No matter what we did or who we tried to please, it could never be enough. We were lost, broken, separate from God, without peace. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Jesus came, bearing the weight of our sin and taking on our punishment so that we could be free. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, our risen Savior. Jesus is worthy. He is alive, and he is the one who brings hope. In him, there is victory. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Well, hello, church. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He sure has. What a privilege we have to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. This is not just a typical weekend or another church service or a festival or a concert. We gather under the authority of the name of Jesus to give glory and honor and praise to him. He is transforming lives today, and I'm one of those, and I pray that you are as well. We're glad you're here. I, I apologize that the weather's not better. <laughs> I like it when God shows off. You know, this is his sanctuary. 
There's nothing we can construct or put together or imagine that can even remotely compare with what God has given us. All of creation cries out that there is a God and that he's worthy of all glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Can you hear me even back there in Williamson County? Yeah, you can. You know why all these people are over here, right? It's the food trucks. They heard somebody say that if you eat outdoors, all the calories evaporate. Don't we wish it were true we'd all have outdoor kitchens? No, we're delighted you're here as we begin our Easter weekend celebration. We're so thankful we can be together. It wasn't that long ago we didn't have that privilege. And so we are delighted that we have the opportunity to gather with God's people to give glory and honor to Jesus. And tonight we're especially excited that C.C. Winans is with us. Yeah. Hallelujah. I told her, she came off stage and I said, if I, if I can't minister after that, I got to quit and go to the house. <laughs> She'll be back in just a few minutes for a concert and to minister to us. You know, whatever you may have come to this place with tonight, whatever challenge or need or opportunity, you know, while we minister to the Lord, you receive from him. There's no specific point in the service where God ministers and the other times where he doesn't. If she's ministering in music and you lift your heart to the Lord, you receive what he has for you. He'll bring health to your body and peace to your mind and deliverance to your soul. Our God is a deliverer. We didn't come simply to do a Bible study. We came to encounter a living king. Amen. Amen. Well, when COVID happened, we met outside in this location for the better part of a year, on and off at least, and made many changes to how we did worship and church and life. One of the changes is we don't pass offering plates every week, things you never thought you would hear the pastor say. Neither did I candidly, but we did learn that the corporate prayers of God's people are an essential part of a healthy community. And so every time we gather, we do an offertory prayer to acknowledge the faithfulness of God's people and their generosity and their giving. And our confidence in God is the one who secures our future. We have assignments and responsibilities, but God is the one who secures our future, not governments, not elections, not political parties not the state of the economy, not the denomination that we belong to or the congregation where we worship. God himself secures our future. So I, I don't want to miss that offertory prayer with you. Uh, I'll give you just a bit of instruction. You got a, did you get a green bag when you came to church tonight? I'm going to keep referring to that. There's all sorts of helpful things in there, one of which is an offering envelope. If you're old school and you want to make a physical gift on campus tonight, you can use that envelope. And there are wooden boxes all throughout the, the outdoor sanctuary where you can place those. If you're inside the building, at the entrances to each of the sanctuaries, there are those same offertory boxes. Or if you're one of the majority who give digitally, you can do that from the website or from the church website or from our app. However you're giving, thank you for your generosity. We learned that we could change our patterns and the faithfulness of God's people would not diminish. I didn't know that before. <clears throat> so this old dog can still learn new tricks. Keep praying. But for our offertory prayer tonight, I want to pray for all the places in the earth where they'll be celebrating Easter this week. For us, it's a, fr it's a privilege. We have the liberty and freedom to gather in public and to talk about Jesus without fear of reprisal. For many, many places in the world, that is not true. So we want to pray for the church in the earth tonight that the love of God would be known in this generation as never before, that the name of Jesus would be li lifted up in the languages of the earth, presented in ways where people can hear and understand, where children can have a future because of the grace and the mercy and the love of God. We're so naive sometimes. We imagine that the United Nation or the cooperation of human beings will secure the future of our children. There's nothing in human history to suggest that that notion is based in fact. Only God can do that for them. So our assignment is to do all we can to invite God fully into the earth. Will you stand with me for that offertory prayer? Have you met the people near you? I hope you didn't just come in and sit down, put your sunglasses on and ignore everybody. 
Before I pray, why don't you say hello to a person or two near you? All right, that's enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the great honor we have of gathering in the name of Jesus, that you would provide such a beautiful place, such a beautiful day, and the freedom and liberty that we might do so. We thank you for that. We recognize that those freedoms come from you. And we pause today to praise you for it, to thank you that in your great love for us, you sent your son to the earth. And we pray for your people in the earth tonight as, as they're preparing and celebrating Easter. Lord, I pray in those places where there are great pressure and opposition that you'll provide everything that's needed, your protection, your grace, your mercy, the resources. May those who have been frustrated and stand in opposition withdraw. May the peace of God watch over your people. Lord, I pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up that the spirits that have opposed that will relinquish. We thank you for wide doors for effectual ministry that will be opened in nation after nation, city after city, community after community. Raise up voices to speak the truth, men and women who will yield themselves to the authority of Jesus' name and the leading of the Holy Spirit. We pray especially for the children of our generation, that they would hear the truth and they would hear it clearly and consistently that there would be men and women who would stand on their behalf for their protection. I thank you for it, that throughout the earth, the name of Jesus will be lifted up and men and women will lift their voices to give praise and honor and glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You better give the Lord a hand. All right, you may be seated. Now, you should have an outline of my message in that green bag. If you looked ahead, don't panic. I'm not going to read all those verses. They needed that outline almost a month ago. A month ago, all I was really sure of is when Easter was. So that's kind of a starter. The, I want to talk to you about a, a cast of characters that are a part of the rather familiar Easter narrative. You know, the challenge of Easter weekend is you know the story. But there's a cast of characters that are presented to us through the Gospels primarily, some of whom we give consideration to and some, quite candidly, we've almost completely ignored. And I would suggest to you that it's the most unlikely characters who become believers in Jesus, who come to understand him as a risen Lord. And the ones that I would have anticipated that would have raised their hand and acknowledged him and served him withdraw from that arena. So with the help of Matthew's gospel, we're going to look at their lives. But I want to start with two short verses that are not in your notes. I don't know if they can put them on the screens or not, but if they don't, you can check me later. They're really in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 8 is a two-sentence commentary on the Exodus, the deliverance of the children of, the, of Israel, the Hebrew slaves, from the land of Egypt after hundreds of years of slavery. This is the commentary. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. I don't believe they're empty words or they're, they're given to us in any melodramatic way. I believe it's, it's, a, it's a clear, accurate description of how God brought the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. His deliverance was expressed in his great strength and power. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, it brought great terror to his opponents and his people saw miraculous signs and wonders. I believe God working in the earth, that's an accurate description historically, but I also believe it's an accurate description of what God is doing in the earth today. We've been acclimated to attend worship services, to be religious, to be kind and polite, to be tame, because we're people of faith. I don't believe our God is tame. And often he's not polite. A, a, a revelation of Almighty God strikes terror into the hearts of the people who have opposed him. And God is moving in the earth. I'll give you some examples before we're done. 
And then in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 20, 26, the, the writer of Hebrews is actually quoting an Old Testament prophet. But he said, God said, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. There are times in throughout history, both biblical history and the history of the church, when God has very clearly brought a shaking to the earth. Dramatic realignment. When he's raised up empires and he's torn others down. He's done it in the lives of his covenant people through the Hebrew Bible, and he's done it throughout the life of his covenant people since Jesus arrived on planet earth. And I believe he's doing it today. I want to go back to Matthew's gospel now and ask you to look with me at what Matthew has to say to us about those seasons right around Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. Because I believe there are some parallels between the shaking in the first century and the shaking in the 21st century. Do you believe that's a possibility? I hope you don't just read your Bible as a historical book or something that presents theological concepts to you. If you've done that, you have relegated the Bible to a distant place. You stand outside of it and you pass judgment on the truth that you'll accept or you'll reject. I would invite you to a different posture with Scripture. Decide that it's authoritative, that it's a revelation of the character of Almighty God. And it tells us how you and I, as a part of his creation, might enter into a relationship with him. That if we will comply with what's presented and yield to the authority of what's there, it transforms our lives. That is not the most typical approach to scripture these days. But in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 27, there's a challenge to faith, a challenge to Jesus' faith. It's very important, I think, to, to establish in our own hearts that even Jesus faced tremendous challenges to, to fulfilling what God created him for. We've lived with the mistaken notion that honoring God is easy, that it should be fun and simple, and it wouldn't be complex, and there would seldom be opposition. Those ideas are wonderful. They're just not supported by Scripture. In Matthew 27 and verse 27, it says, The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him. They took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And they mocked him. And they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And they led him away to crucify him. If you love the Lord, that's a difficult passage to read. Jesus surrounded by Roman soldiers who could care less about his narrative. They're not interested in his story. He's a prisoner that's been handed over to them. They have complete and total authority over him. They intend to torture him to death. But before they get to the public place of Golgotha for that public intimidating act of torture, they're in the private setting, their courtyard, and they begin to mock him. They begin to torture him. Again, please note, even Jesus did not escape the challenges of life. Some of us mistakenly think because our lives have not unfolded in the way that we wanted them to or we imagined they would, that God has either abandoned us or he's unjust. I agree with you. I don't always understand God's timing or the circumstances that are a part of my journey. But I assure you that God is just. And what we don't understand in the moment, if we will quietly and faithfully continue to pursue God, he will bring awareness to in our lives. My most consistent objection to God is with his sense of timing. He has simply not looked at my calendar. If he would allow me, I would help him. We could sort this thing out in a hurry. And I suspect that Jesus had a few of those feelings. The soldiers mock him. They humiliate him. He's treated like a common criminal. And those torturing have no awareness of the circumstances of his life. Matthew pushes it a bit further. Same chapter, chapter 27 and verse 50. It says, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. He's on the cross there. And his life comes to a conclusion. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In the temple in Jerusalem, the holiest place in all of Judaism, it's divided into different segments, and the most holy place in the temple is the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, 
and it's separated from every other por portion by a very thick curtain. And only the high priest is allowed into the Holy of Holies, and he can only enter once a year, and then he can only enter with the blood of the Passover lamb. And when Jesus breathed his last on the cross, that curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. But Matthew didn't stop there. These are some of the most interesting verses in the New Testament to me. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn, the earth shook, and the rocks split. Remember I said God shakes the earth? The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. I've read those verses many, many times. It gives us just enough information to be tantalizing. I have so many questions. This was the moment when Jesus gave up his life on the cross. And the earth shook and the rocks split. And those who had, some who had died earlier were brought back to life. Well, it says after Jesus' resurrection, that's a couple of days away. They went into Jerusalem. Where'd they hang out in the interim? You think they played Rook in the cemetery? <laughs> Maybe they had to get online and catch up. They were behind on their social media accounts. I don't know. I don't mean it disrespectfully, but the, the, the entire story isn't related to us. We simply know that God shook the earth and his power was such that it brought dead people back to life again. Do you, bring God, do you believe that God brings life to those places that are dead? I do. I'm dependent upon that. And then in verse 54, it says, When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Now that captures my attention. There's a tremendous shaking, a demonstration of God's power. And then a centurion acknowledges a truth that quite honestly, I would have expected from many other people, not him. Perhaps the high priest watching that would have said, we made a horrible mistake. He was the son of God. Even Pilate, the Roman governor, he'd interviewed Jesus. He understood he was innocent. Maybe Pilate could have changed his opinion and said, I've made a horrible mistake. It's a very unlikely response from the centurion, a man hardened by his life choices. He's tortured many people to death. You would imagine him to be completely immune to the circumstances of human suffering. He does it as a part of routine. And yet on this day, watching what happens when Jesus gives up his life, he acknowledges the activity of God. It's shocking to me. He's not Jewish. He doesn't keep the rules. He doesn't keep kosher. He doesn't celebrate the right holidays. He's a pagan godless, violent, murderous man. And he has this remarkable acknowledgement. A transformation is beginning in him. Look in verse 62 of that same passage. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate answers, take a guard, go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. And they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, I don't know how you read your Bible. When I read it, I try to put myself into the circumstance. I try to imagine that I was in the room when that interaction took place. And I'm trying to process it and gain a perspective. And, and perhaps when I read that, I, I could, if you choose to give every possible consideration to Pilate and the chief priests, at this point, you could say, if you wanted to, if you wanted to give them every possible benefit of the doubt, that they're just still trying to maintain the integrity of the narrative. We watched him die on a cross. He told these tales that we don't believe in. Let's be certain that nothing happens to perpetuate the deception. I believe that's more generous than the text suggests, but it's a possible way to read it. Because by this time, 
There's evidence being offered by centurions that Jesus was the Son of God. Not by disciples, not by people who enjoyed his teaching, not by people who ate when he fed the crowd with a, a young man's happy meal. But Roman centurions are saying, this man is the son of God. I assure you it didn't take that message long to spread amongst the soldiers who oversaw the crucifixions in Jerusalem. And yet at this point, the, the chief priest and the Pharisees and the Roman governor are still determined to maintain their narrative. The next chapter, chapter 28 and verse 1, after Sabbath, at dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, God shaking the earth again. Folks, we think there's a shaking and we're done. It seems to me it's more episodic. Jesus used the imagery of the beginning of birth pains. My father was a veterinarian. I've watched lots of things be born. I, I observed something. Once those birth pains begin, they continue to increase in both frequency and intensity until something arrives whether it's a kitten or a puppy or a calf or a foal, whatever it may be. So when I think of God shaking the earth, I think of birth pains, and it seems most appropriate to me that they, they are, it's not a single event. And so the earth, there's a violent earthquake, an angel of the Lord came down and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow and the guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay and then go tell the fellas. It's worth noting the women were at the tomb. The guys weren't. <laughs> don't send me an email. <laughs> but again, there's another violent shaking. This time it's an earthquake. The angels have a message for those women. But I don't want you to miss those nameless people that are in the narrative because so far they've been more on track than the ones we would have anticipated. It says the guards were terrified. Understandably, the man they had tortured to death has been delivered from death. They have witnessed a new power. There's been something new presented to them. An entirely new reality is now part of their experience. We saw him die. We know he was dead. We've killed a lot of men. We've tortured a lot of people to death. That man was dead. And we know he's alive. Now, that's disorienting. One of the things that is a characteristic of great shaking is that it's confusing. Because things that you've counted on, things that you've depended upon, things you've relied upon begin to shake. But if you understand that God is moving, that his purposes are moving forward, it diminishes the fear and it brings a great sense of hope and anticipation. The women have a message from God. The guards, they're faced with a choice to believe what they've experienced, to believe what they know to be factually true and to cooperate or to ignore their experience. Now, I'm going to suggest to you repeatedly that every one of us has, has a very similar path in our lives, that God makes himself known to us, perhaps not in the dramatic way that he did to those guards, but he makes himself known to us. The scripture tells us that. And every time we have a glimpse, an awareness, an invitation into the understanding that there is a God, we make a choice whether or not we will incorporate that into our practices and our belief if we will yield to what our experience says is true or whether we'll do our best to ignore it. Let's follow the narrative. It's helpful. Same chapter, Matthew 28, in verse 11. It says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. They told them, you were to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him. We'll keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So there's all the drama at the tomb. 
earthquakes, a stone rolled away. The guards can't miss it. They're so terrified of what's happening that they play possum. If you're not from Middle Tennessee, you'll have to ask somebody to explain that. I'm not going to do it. They're terrified, but they go to give their report. Because if you're entrusted with guarding someone, if you've been entrusted to, to secure the prison or to secure, in this case, a tomb, and whoever you're guarding escapes, to, historically, typically, you would be paying with your life. So some of the guards go to give a report. At this point, the chief priests have a choice. They have credible eyewitnesses saying something most dramatic happened. There was an earthquake, a tomb rolled away, the tomb was empty. We believe the man who was dead is alive. The chief priests have a choice to make. They can believe the eyewitness accounts of the activity. And it's worth noting for you and me that the, the accounts are not coming from Jesus' disciples. They're not coming from his friends or his followers, but they're coming from Roman guards. The alternative for the chief priests is to cling to their false narrative and to maintain the deception. But they're not the only ones with a choice. The guards themselves have a choice. They can tell the truth which they've experienced. They can relate what they know to be factual. They can become messengers, or they can cooperate with the deception. What Matthew reports to us is that the guards chose the money and the perceived opportunity that it represented rather than to stand for what is true. I wish I could say to you that was only a first century behavior, but I think in all of our lives, we wrestle with those same struggles. When we're presented with the reality of God, with his truth, with what it means to honor Jesus of Nazareth in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our extended families, with our friends. Most of us have an awareness of that, some understanding of what that means. And we are consistently presented with opportunities to either honor the Lord in those places or to simply act as if we didn't notice and we become a part of the deception. I believe God is moving in the earth. There was a shaking taking place in that first century, which extended far beyond the earthquake and the rolling away of a burial stone. The son of God was in the earth. There was an invitation before that generation. Well, if you'll allow me, I would submit to you that I believe once again, God is shaking the earth. I don't believe it's Satan. I don't believe it's some demonic host, but almighty God himself has begun to shake the earth. We read the passage in Hebrews quoting from the Hebrew prophets where God said, I will shake the earth and his intent. My understanding of God's purpose in those seasons of shaking is about revelation to reveal those things which are fragile, transient, and which can be shaken in order to reveal that which is unshakable, his eternal kingdom. Because the story of humanity through antiquity to the present day is we have a tendency to wander off of the path into the weeds. We have the tendency to adopt the narrative that I can do it, that I can make it happen. I can secure my future, that I'm the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong, that I should ascend the throne, that it's my life, my time, my attention, my choice, and I will yield to no one. That's the default position of humanity through all the ages. And God in his mercy, from time to time, initiates a shaking to expose those things that we put our trust in that in reality are not trustworthy, that they certainly don't deserve the dependence and the confidence that we have placed in them so that we might have the opportunity to bring realignment to our lives and put our trust in God more fully. I would suggest that 2020 was the beginning of another season of shaking. It wasn't that long ago. It was presented to us initially as a tremendous threat to our health. But the outcomes of that virus from Wuhan have been a visible shaking of established things. I brought you just a sample. You could make a list from your perspective, much different than mine, but we have all seen many things that seemed almost immutable just four years ago, dramatically shaken. 
the one that's most obvious to me is our churches were shaken. We were told we were non-essential and to disband. And we complied. The outcome of that decision has been a greatly diminished participation in church across our nation. I've been in more than 20 cities in recent months. And I can tell you from personal experience, the churches are struggling. It's not about a single denomination or tradition or region. People all across our nation have stepped back from participation in public worship. There are many that celebrate that with great glee and delight. But the outcome, it seems to me, is a more timid, compliant church, which seems to be subjugated to the voices of our culture. Rather than having the courage to stand with a biblical worldview and be the conscience of our culture. Science was shaken. We were told to follow the science. It would keep us safe and provide the best pathway forward. I'm good with that. I'm more than happy to follow the science. Science is a method. It's a way of understanding our world. Science is measurable, reproducible, and consistent. What we experienced, it wasn't science. It differed from state to state, governor to governor. And really inexplicably, the scientists, for the most part, didn't say much to challenge the narrative. Faith in public institutions was shaken. Trusted sources of information proved to be untrustworthy. We could give a long list. The CDC. I had no reason not to trust them fully prior to 2020. The FBI, the media. Propaganda has replaced our observable reality. It's confusing. We watch things happening like stones being rolled away and rocks being shaken. And the message comes that there's nothing happening, nothing to see here. Go home and shelter in place for two weeks and you can return to normal. They lied, but I missed the apology. I missed the expression of realignment that would have reinstituted trust and enable us to build the future confidently together. We just kept moving, acting like we didn't really say that. It didn't matter. We didn't mean it. The vaccine will prevent infection. We're not. Censorship became a common practice. We've been introduced to a whole realm of new labels, and we've accepted them as pretty normative. Things like misinformation, whoo, don't be caught doing that. Or disinformation or malinformation. It keeps morphing a bit. My best memory is that we have always defended the right to free speech, even if it was, if it was something that we considered rather broadly to be wrong. We would stand up for one another. Since when have we lost the ability to express our opinion? The list could go on and on, but it's not really the purpose. I believe another episode. I told you it was episodic. It was in the Gospel of Matthew. I believe it is in the earth today. I believe on October the 7th of last year, another episode of shaking took place. It didn't take place in our own nation, not directly, but there was a vicious attack from Gaza led by Hamas against the people of Israel. It was brutal, inhumane, purposely degrading, murderous. There was violence against women and children, a tremendous loss of Jewish life, the greatest loss in a single day since the Holocaust, World War II. It's unthinkable. Completely candidly, I did not recognize the impact on the day of that attack. I understood it was heinous. I, under, I understood something of what had happened, but I didn't recognize it in that moment as another expression of God's shaking in the earth. I've recognized the impact of the shaking in the days which have followed. Folks, it's a season where we have to watch and listen and think and act more than perhaps in previous times. Previously, since that day, since October the 7th, in this nation, previously imagined elite centers of academia have absolutely refused to condemn what Hamas did. It's unthinkable. It's not complicated. There's no moral equivalency in play. It's unimaginable. And they steadfastly refuse. In fact, we have seen and experienced widespread support for the murderous behavior of terrorists, Hamas publicly declares, it's a part of their charter, their declared intent to commit genocide against the Jewish people. 
in our nation, leaders at the highest level to continue to call for sanctions, limits upon Israel's responses. Anti-Semitism, it's a fancy word for hating the Jewish people. We wanted to believe desperately that the end of World War II when the horrors of the Holocaust were finally acknowledged by the larger community, that we could once and for all push anti-Semitism out of the public arena. We once believed it to be as uncommon in our nation as the measles. Tragically, we find ourselves now where both are flourishing in our midst. The shaking is revealing the intent of people's hearts and the nature of their alignments. You have to pay attention. There's been no such call. There's been these, there's this unrelenting drumbeat for a humanitarian ceasefire. It's shouted daily, cascades over us like a waterfall, but there's been no such call for the war in Ukraine. And in that conflict, more than 500,000 people have lost their lives. It completely dwarfs the numbers involved in Gaza. But the UN, the media, and so many people of influence demand that Israel be stopped. There's something you should understand, I should understand. We as the people of faith need to process that the hatred of the Jewish people, anti-Semitism, is motivated by the spirit of Antichrist. And if that doesn't capture your attention, the book of Revelation tells us that, that the spirit of Antichrist will ultimately be embodied in, in, in an individual, easy for me to say, that will be the most beastly leader that our world has ever known. So when I see expressions of the spirit of Antichrist in the world, it has my unfocused attention. It's a spiritual expression which is growing throughout the earth. It's illogical, it's irrational, it's indefensible, but it is very prevalent in some very powerful ways. The list could go on and on. There's shaking in our families. They want to redefine marriage. They've tried to redefine authority in our homes to tell us that the the presidents of the teachers' union should have more authority over what our children are taught than the opinions of our parents. What nonsense. There have been shakings in our educational systems, shaking in our financial systems. We've experienced some minor tremors in our financial systems. I, am, I don't imagine a future where we escape significant shakings in those financial systems. Folks, we're $34 trillion in debt. And we're handing out cash like we make it with our color printers. It's an unsustainable pattern. Now, I've said all of that to give you an invitation that I think Matthew presented to us. In the midst of all the shaking and opportunity is being presented, just as certainly it was, as it was presented to the guards at the tomb, to the soldiers who participated in the crucifixion, or to the high priest, or to the Roman governor of Judea. It, the invitation reaches across all the barriers which we have imagined separate us. How we look and the accent with which we speak, the circumstances of our education, the truth is available and accessible, but there is a cost often attached to embracing the truth. It was true in the first century, and I assure you it's true in the 21st century. I have a question. I'm about done. What will you do with the Jesus story? I believe the shaking will intensify in both frequency and strength. I want to ask the question again, what will you do with the Jesus story? Will you be intentional in choosing to honor Jesus? I would like to encourage you not to allow silence and inactivity to be your expression of a choice. It's very popular right now. Act like we don't notice. Look away. Don't talk about it. That's just not a conversation we like to have. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. The truth often is, but it's necessary. Ignoring the truth does not diminish its authority or change the reality. Church, we have an assignment. Jesus told us we were to be salt and light. He's coming back to the earth just as certainly as he was born in Bethlehem, just as certainly as he walked out of that tomb in Jerusalem. And he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Many of us have had an experience with the Lord. 
We may have said the sinner's prayer, made a confession of faith. We, we've understood the new birth. We've been born again, whichever label you use for that entry into the kingdom of God. But I want to caution you. A singular experience does not guarantee spiritual growth, health, and vitality. Any more than the healthy birth of a child guarantees the healthy development, the healthy development of that life. And for far too long, we've been showing our birth certificates and ignoring the narrative about our growth and development and our increasing yielding to the Lordship of Jesus. So this Easter, I want to give you an invitation. I want to ask you to have the boldness of that centurion and be willing to say out loud for whomever might be interested in listening that I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and that I've chosen, chosen him as Lord of my life then I will serve him as my king. I'm not really trying to just encourage you to attend church. Folks, you can sit in church and not be a Christ follower. It's like sitting in the gym and thinking you're an Olympic athlete. I wish. I'd spend more time at the gym. And I think we've been deluded for too long. We're going to take communion together in a moment. It's the sacrifice Jesus made that you and I might be forgiven. You have the elements in that green bag. You can go ahead and grab them, but I'm going to ask you to say a prayer with me before we get to communion. If you didn't grab a bag when you came in, if you ignored that opportunity, there's some ushers, some folks walking around. I won't, they're not in the aisles because we don't have those. But if you raise your hand, capture their attention. If you're joining us online, you're someplace else, you can go grab a cup of water and a saltine cracker. You can take communion with us. You don't have to have one of our little handy-dandy communion kits. You can use a glass of milk and an Oreo cookie. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you don't have to have a religious emblem stamped on a, a wafer in order for it to matter. Isn't that good? But before we come to the communion table, I want to ask you to say a prayer of preparation with me. We know the tradition of communion, the ritual of communion, the pattern or the habit based on the traditions that you've been a part of. But I don't want to miss the invitation of God. He's moving in the earth in ways I've never seen in all of my life. And I've spent my adult life in the Christian church. What we're witnesses to today, I have never seen in any season before. And I don't believe we're finished yet. I'm not frightened. I'm filled with a sense of anticipation. I know there's tremendous movement taking place. I see God stirring the hearts of people in ways I've never seen him stir them before. And I see expressions of evil in the public square that I never imagined were possible. Both things are happening simultaneously. So recognizing Jesus and the place you give him in your life is more essential than it's ever been. Will you join me in this prayer, and then we'll share communion together. It's in your notes. I think they'll put it on the screens. We can read it together. Heavenly Father, forgive me for all the times I have resisted you. Thank you for your great love and the mercy you have shown. I want to honor you with my life, to honor Jesus in my life, in everything I do. Forgive me of my sins. I forgive all those who have sinned against me. Today is a new beginning, a new life for me. Jesus, be Lord in me and through me each day. I thank you for my freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Now, I want to invite you to the communion table with us. You don't have to be a participant at a world outreach to share the Lord's table. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are welcome to the Lord's table. Isn't that good to know? That no denomination has a lock on that. No minister. Hallelujah. Jesus himself put this in place. He celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples on the night he would be betrayed. Prior to going to Gethsemane in his arrest, he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. They hadn't seen him crucified yet. I assure you they didn't understand fully what he was saying to them. It, it made much greater, had greater significance to them after his resurrection than it did that night. But at the end of the Passover meal, he reached over to the place that was prepared for Elijah. And he took bread 
and he broke it and he said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. I used to always tell the church that if there was sin in your life, you wouldn't be able to get that little cellophane <laughs> lid open. It's not true, but I said it a number of times. And one Sunday in church, I couldn't get the cellophane lid open. <laughs> and one of the cameramen that was helping us decided to focus on that. <laughs> he doesn't help us anymore. <laughs> no, that's not true. He still helps us. You know, the, the truth that we hold is serious. But sometimes we take ourselves a bit too serious. God changes broken lives. He heals broken hearts. He helps us overcome poor decisions. He's provided so that we could be forgiven and justified and sanctified and cleansed. And for that reason, we come to the communion table. It's through the blood of Jesus that all of those things happen, not by my ability to keep the rules. Jesus took the cup at that same meal and said, so this cup is a new covenant, literally a new contract, sealed with my own blood. As often as you drink it, you proclaim my death until you see me again. Let's receive together. You stand with me for a prayer. You know, I'm, I'm certain that there are people that have come to this service with great needs. And I want you to know that our God is a redeemer and a deliverer. And as we offer this prayer, you've received that bread and that cup, God's provision for your life and mine. Whether we need forgiveness or mercy or grace or the strength to forgive another or the power of God to set us free from a habit or the strength of God to bring life to our mortal bodies or peace to our soul, whatever it may be. The Spirit of the Lord is present to minister to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you that in your great love for us, you sent your Son. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that you offered yourself as a sacrifice, that you took upon yourself the punishment that was due by divine justice, our sin, our rebellion, and our ungodliness that we in turn might receive all of the blessings due your perfect obedience. And Lord, by the profession of our mouth tonight and by receiving the bread and the cup, we have received your life into our lives. And I thank you now that you'll bring health to our bodies and peace to our minds and hope to our souls, life into our homes. Lord, you're the author and the completer of our story. And as we walk through this season of shaking, we ask you to chart a course for us a course that's triumphant and victorious. May we be more aware of your abiding presence than any threat that we can perceive. May we know that our God is a deliverer, that he's a strong tower, that his arm is not too short nor his strength too small to save his people. We receive it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. I need to give you a couple of instructions before you start to move. If you're here to be baptized, please go ahead and start to make your way to the pool. If you're with them, a family or a friend, you can move with them. We're going to set the stage. Cece will be back just in a moment or two to begin the concert and lead us into the presence of the Lord more fully. If you have children inside in one of the classes, please go find them. The concert will extend plenty of time for you to be back for more of that. There's a greeting that's as old as the Christian church. I want to close with that. If you met someone and you didn't know if they were a believer, you would say, he is risen. And if they believed Jesus was the Son of God, they would respond, he's risen indeed. That's your line. On three, he's risen. He's risen indeed. God bless you and happy Easter.
We're going to celebrate our friends getting baptized tonight. So when they come up out of the water, we want you to cheer. We want you to rejoice. Say glory to God. Hallelujah. But let's just celebrate what the Lord's doing in their lives tonight. I was buried beneath my shade. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Glory to God. Turn the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew, Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shell, amen. I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now you're When you call my name, sing it out. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call to your glorious day you call
Amen. So come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Yeah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, if this doesn't make you smile, I'm not sure I can help you. But CC will. We are honored. You know, Nashville, people think it's a music place, and it is. But there's a handful of people that have set a tone for so much of Nashville. And CC Winans has been a strength to the body of Christ. And we are honored to have her with us this Easter weekend. You help me welcome her back. We're going to worship the Lord with CC Winans.
Sue and one says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse four, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How many know, just like he did it before, we need him to do it again tonight? Amen? Come on, y'all. Just like you did it before, Lord, we are ready for more. Just like you did it before, Lord, we are ready for more. Just like, just like you did it before, Lord, we, Lord, we are ready for more. Just like, just like you did it before, Lord, we, Lord, we are ready for more. Lord, we, Lord, we.
is faithful. Amen? Amen? Tonight, I don't know what you're believing God for, but I came to remind you that he's faithful. And if he said it, we believe it. How many know it's done? Anybody believe in God for something tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, release your faith and say, Lord, Lord I, believe. I believe. Say it again. Say, Lord. Hallelujah. We're so grateful that the name of Jesus is above every name. Every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. The name of Jesus is stronger than every disease. The name of Jesus is bigger than any problem. Lord, we thank you that your name is above every name. And tonight, we release our faith for the impossible. Oh, yeah, some of us have been praying a long time, but we're going to keep believing because we know that your word is true. We know that you're not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for the impossible. Speak to your mountain tonight and command it to move in Jesus' name. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you power in your name. 
We don't live our lives being led by our emotions or by our feelings, but we're led by the Spirit of God. And we stand on the Word of God. If God said it, we believe it, and it's done. Amen? You said, I believe it. You said, it is done. You said, I believe it. You said, it is done. Can you help me see?
worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Can you sing that with me tonight? You're worthy of it all. Yes, Lord. You're worthy of it all.
God's word He's so worthy He really is He really is He's so worthy He's so Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. God is so good. He's worthy of all the praise. Let's worship him and let's sing about the goodness of God. Your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God I love your voice Yes, God You have led me through the fire And in darkest night you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Hey! Cause all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, he has.
sing that. you can put those hands together and let them know that he's good. Let them know that he's worthy. I know Pastor Allen, I give honor to Pastor Allen and so honored to be here tonight and I know he's already prayed the prayer of salvation but in case someone has come who wasn't here earlier, I would love to give you the opportunity to make Jesus your Lord. I would love to lead you in a salvation prayer. And the Bible says that if you confess the Lord with your mouth, the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, you shall be saved. Amen. Doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been, God is waiting to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. He paid the price on the cross for your sins so that we wouldn't have to. His love for you was so great that even while we were still sinners, he died for us. And the blood of Jesus has paid the price. Anybody glad about that? So tonight, if you want to be saved, we're going to pray this prayer. And if you pray it and believe it, you will be saved. Remember, this is not about religion, but it's a relationship with Jesus. So tonight, I'm going to pray, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Those of us who already know the Lord, I want you to repeat it too for those who are repeating it for the first time, they will hear our love and our support. So here we go. Close your eyes, bow your head, say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I, come to you I come to you in the name of your Son, of your son Jesus. Jesus. I, believe I believe he died on the cross, on the cross for, my sins. for my sins. And I believe, I believe on the third day, the third day you, raised you raised them from the grave. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Of my sins. Forgive me. Forgive me. Wash, me Wash me and make me whole. Make me whole. I, invite I invite you to come into my, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life, Lord of my life. For, the of my life. for the rest of my life. Fill me, Fill me with, your Holy Spirit with your Holy Spirit so that I will be empowered, so be empowered 
to live a life pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put those hands together. Give God praise. Welcome to the family of God. Come on, you can make more noise than that. Heaven rejoices over one soul. And all my life you have been so. all right welcome to the family of God if that was your first time praying that prayer you need to get into a church and this is a fabulous church to be a part of do I have any witnesses here today so that you can learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ amen now we're going to join in with the angels tonight anybody ready to cry out holy, holy. come on cry out holy to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Please. 
to thee. Come on, everybody, lift your voices and sing. I could describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I found. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful. We 
Give him all the honor. Give him all the praise. All together,